welcome you to the sixth session of the uh, Santa Clara County Court of Historical Inquiry. Uh, we're convened today to uh, hear the case of uh, Montgomery versus the Wright brothers, a fraternity suit to determine who was the true father of American aviation. Uh, please remain seated and come to order. The Santa Clara County Court of Historical Inquiry is now in session. The Honorable Peter Stone, Judge. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. This court of historical inquiry, histor uh, historical inquiry, uh, is now in session. Welcome to the jury. Counsel, your appearances, please. Gary Newstetter, appearing on behalf of John J. Montgomery. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Richard Alexander for the defendants, Orville and Wilbur Wright, the true fathers of modern American aviation. Well, this court is here to find the mother of all aviation. <laughs> <laughs> I won't default you at this time. All right, uh, counsel for the plaintiff. I think that was well spoken, Your Honor. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere, as you know. Uh, counsel for the plaintiffs may proceed first, uh, perhaps with a little opening statement. Yes, Your Honor, I do have an opening statement. May it please the court. Gentlemen of the jury, today we confront a question that has been left up in the air too long. <laughs> Who is the true father of American aviation, John Montgomery or the Wright brothers? But before we begin, let me ask you please to bring your seat backs to a full upright position <laughs> to make sure that your seat belts are securely fashioned, fastened, and above all, to stow the baggage of your preconceptions beneath your seats. <laughs> Not 300 yards from this very spot stands an obelisk dedicated to the memory of a great aviation pioneer, John J. Montgomery. The obelisk was dedicated on the anniversary of his historic flight in 1905 from a height of more than 4,000 feet twisting and turning and gliding safely to a landing here in Santa Clara. What was the altitude? 4,000 feet, Your Honor. That obelisk records the remarks of Octave Chanu, perhaps the greatest American civil engineer of the late 19th century. This flight of Montgomery's was the most daring feat ever attempted. It also records the remarks of Alexander Graham Bell, all subsequent attempts at aviation must begin with the Montgomery machine. I invite you all to visit the obelisk, even in the rain, this afternoon after the trial. Today, we will learn about not only this flight, but his other remarkable accomplishments, including his first flight in 1883 in San Diego County, California, a full 20 years before the Wright brothers allegedly flew to Kitty Hawk. We will learn about his contributions to aerodynamic theory, to the stability and control of the aircraft, to airframe structure. And we will hear this benefit and courtesy of Professor Mark Ardema, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Santa Clara University, and for 21 years, an engineer at NASA Ames Research Center, working on the conception and design of advanced aircraft. We will also have the pleasure of meeting and hearing from actress Shirley MacLaine, <laughs> who will tell us about the movie Gallant, a Hollywood epic portraying the life of John J. Montgomery. Now that movie was an important step in giving John Montgomery his due. For unlike the Wright brothers, John Montgomery was not a self-promoter. He did not benefit from the power and the exaggerations of the Eastern press. No, he was a quiet and unsung local hero. He deserves more than the street name you'll find in downtown San Jose, <laughs> more than the name Montgomery Hill you'll find at Evergreen Valley where he made a number of his famous flights, more even than the accolades bestowed upon him by the citizens of San Diego 
when they named their international airport in his honor, Montgomery Field. Yes, he deserves more. He deserves recognition from you of his true place in history, the father of American aviation. And I'm confident that it will take no flight of your imagination to reach that conclusion. Council, yeah, so I don't suppose you're willing to waive opening statement, Mr. Alexander. After having heard that, I'm ready to move for a directed verdict. <laughs> but I will. Council, that won't fly. <laughs> I thought that might be the case. I'll reserve, Your Honor. All right, Council, you may put on your first witness. Yes, John Montgomery calls Professor Mark Artema to the stand. Please state your name for the record. Mark Artema. And where are you currently employed? Here at the University of Santa Clara. I'm the uh, professor of mechanical engineering and chairman of the mechanical engineering department. Okay, and can you tell us about your aeronautical engineering credentials, please? Uh, I have a, a PhD degree in mechanical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, with a specialty in aeronautics. And fly? I do not fly. Uh, Any publications on? Yes, I've published over 100 research publications on aeronautical subjects, and I'm also an associate fellow at the American Institute of Aeronautics. Okay, and prior to your employment at Santa Clara, where were you employed, sir? For 21 years at NASA Ames Research Center as a research engineer, mostly involved with uh, studying advanced aircraft concepts, evaluating them, and uh, estimating their performance. Okay. Now, are you familiar with John J. Montgomery? Yes, I am. And how did you become familiar with him? Well, in the, in the course of being an aeronautical engineer, I've uh, always been very interested in aeronautical history, and, and coming to Santa Clara, I was uh, inevitably drawn to uh, studying about the man quite a bit. Okay, so you know quite a bit about him. As much as uh, anyone I believe in. Okay. Now, what I'd like to do, and with the court's permission, is to show a series of slides to the jury, to the court, and to the audience, and have you comment on those slides. Your Honor's permission? You may. Uh, this is John Montgomery, a photograph. Okay, picture of John, handsome looking man. <laughs> this I like believe Richard is Richard Alexander uh, to me. Your Honor, Richard Alexander? <laughs> <laughs> the famous pilot? Okay. This I believe is John Montgomery's mother. Oh, I see. So this we might call the mother of all aviation. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, his uh, airplane in approximately 1905 on the campus of Santa Clara University. The gentleman on uh, the right here is John Montgomery. The, uh, one of the other gentlemen there is uh, Dan Maloney, the pilot that Montgomery trained personally to fly this airplane. And this is just prior to a launch. And this is that 1905 flight from uh, the balloon? Yes. All right. The uh, method of uh, flight was to to take the airplane up to about 4,000 feet by hot air balloon and then release it and then make a controlled flight back to the Earth. Okay. This is a very good picture of the airplane. You can see its basic layout. It, it's a what's called a tandem wing design. It has two more or less equally shaped wings. <coughs> it has the controlling surface, the tail, at the aft end of the airplane. And the way that it was controlled in the longitudinal plane was simply by the pilot sliding back and forth on the bar you see there in the airplane. And uh, this is the same flight uh, with uh, Maloney coming in for a landing. And he landed safely. Safely. And he took off from over 4,000 feet. Yes. And, and he executed turns and various maneuvers. There was a, a large crowd that witnessed this event, including several newspaper people, and they all uh, testified to the fact that he controlled his airplane very effectively. Okay. This, in fact, is the local newspaper account of the event. Okay. Mercury is still using the same format. <laughs> same reporters. <laughs> uh, here we have a poster advertising one of his later flights, and the, the significant thing here is that uh, he calls it the Montgomery Aeroplane, and Montgomery was in fact the first individual to call a flying machine an aeroplane. Not the Wright brothers? 
Oh, uh, they used the term aeroplane, but they referred to that as only the wing part of the aeroplane. Okay, so he was the first one to call the machine an aeroplane. Uh, it was a propulsion. There was none. This was a glider. Glider. This is some later work that uh, he did. This, this is the uh, flying at Evergreen, south of San Jose. And by this time, Montgomery's uh, design had evolved uh, to a very modern looking airplane consisting of a single wing with an aft horizontal and vertical tail. And this is uh, recognized much like airplanes like today. Very modern design, 1910. Montgomery Street in uh, San Jose, that's been alluded to previously. This is the uh, dedication of Montgomery Field in San Diego, San Diego's airport. And it, the, it bears an inscription. Do you remember roughly what the inscription refers to? Uh, roughly it says dedicated to John Montgomery who achieved wing flight first for the first time ever in 1883, first flight by man in 1883. 1883. Okay, and that was uh, in San Diego County? Yes. And this is the dedication of the airfield in his name? That's right. This is the dedication of the obelisk that uh, he referred to that sits just a few yards outside of this building. It has the inscriptions on it that you referred to earlier. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, Professor Artema, if I might ask you uh, a few questions about Montgomery's contributions to aviation and his understanding of aeronautics. Could you describe for us what you consider to be the key elements of successful air flight? Uh, it really takes uh, four things. First of all, it takes an understanding of aerodynamics, that is, how to develop a lifting force that will lift the machine off the ground. The second uh, item is uh, stability and control. You have to design the layout of the airplane such that it has adequate stability and control. And a big part of that is understanding how the pilot influences the airplane. Uh, the third thing is that you have to build the aircraft structure that's light enough so it can get off the ground, but at the same time strong enough so it doesn't fall apart in the, in the low air loads that are applied to it. Mm -hmm. And then the final thing is a propulsion system to propel the aircraft. Why do you consider John Montgomery to be such an important pioneer? <coughs> uh, I feel very strongly that he made uh, key contributions in three of these four areas. So in three of these four areas, aerodynamics, stability and control, airframe structure and propulsion, the first three significant contributions from John Montgomery. <coughs> okay. Let's take a look at each one of those briefly. Uh, what about aerodynamics? What were his contributions there? I think in aerodynamics, uh, he's kind of unique because he combined uh, very uh, good experimental methods with uh, a very good ability to construct theories of aerodynamic behavior. Uh, for example, in the experimental area, he uh, conducted many experiments with flowing water to understand water flows about objects, and uh, later in his career he did a series of experiments of airflow about flat plates, in which he attached tufts of cotton to the plates, and thereby he could determine the direction of airflow at those points. And, uh, that's significant because this is a technique <coughs> in aeronautical research even today. In air, in wind tunnels today? Yeah. Okay. And what about his theoretical contributions to aerodynamics? Uh, he con concocted a mathematical theory of the flow of air that uh, in some respects was a uh, quite modern and, and predicted many important phenomena that you have to know before you can design an airplane, such as uh, <coughs> the difference between static and dynamic pressure, uh, the existence of vortices or rotational columns of air about the wing, and finally a lateral lift distribution. Now we don't have time here today, Doctor, for you to explain all of those concepts, but maybe you could, uh, using the whiteboard there and one of the markers, just demonstrate for us uh, what you mean by lateral airfoil lift distribution. <coughs> Thank you. Now moving on from aerodynamics, uh, what about his contributions to the stability and control of the aircraft? Uh, I think this was probably, probably his uh, most outstanding contribution. He, uh, well first let me say that nobody really at that time period in history understood mathematically stability and control. It was kind of by luck that anybody 
really got to the right answer, but I think more than anyone, he understood what was really going on. For example, uh, uh, an airplane has to be stable and controllable in three axes. One is pitch, one is roll, and one is yaw. And John Montgomery clearly understood that and achieved successful designs uh, based on that understanding. Okay, and are you aware of uh, how the Wright brothers did in that respect, in terms of stability and control of the aircraft? Well, subsequent to the Wright Brothers flight, in fact, only about 10 years ago, there was a very detailed analysis done of the Wright Brothers airplane, and it was discovered that the airplane was unstable in three, two of the three axes. I see. Now, what about the layout, the actual layout of the vehicle, in terms of uh, where the various parts were, were placed? Uh, he uh, actually, over the course of his investigations in flying, evolved a very modern uh, layout for an airplane. As I mentioned earlier, the, the wing in front, the control surfaces in the back, which the way airplanes look today. Then where did he put the tail, for example? He put it at the back of the airplane. He put the tail at the back of the airplane. Now, where did the Wright brothers put the tail of their airplane, sir? They put the horizontal tail in the elevator at the front of the airplane. Well, now, wait a minute. Uh, from a purely legal standpoint, how can a tail be in front unless you're going backwards? <laughs> I'm Let me rephrase the question, Your Honor. What we now call a tail, he put at the front of the airplane. I see. And how did that work out? Uh, not very good. It was a, sort of a miracle that he flew that way. In, in short order, the Wright brothers had their tail at the back also. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, in other words, what they had to do was turn tail. Okay. Okay. <laughs> now, finally, airframe structure. Strike. <laughs> airframe structure, what contributions there? Well, at the time period in, uh, say, 1900, uh, there were very, very few people in the world who could build a successful airplane structure because it was a very delicate balance to get a light enough weight so that you can lift it off the ground and strong enough so it doesn't come apart when it you know, has, has the loads applied. And he obviously could do that because he built many, many uh, successful fighter designs. Okay, and uh, let me ask you just before we, we close here for a few comments more about the Wright brothers. Now, um, is their airplane displo uh, displayed at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C.? Yes, and do you know anything about the circumstances leading to the display of the aircraft there? Uh, yes, it's an interesting story. In the uh, 1920s, Orville Wright was dissatisfied with the recognition that he was getting from the United States for his contribution to flying. And uh, in a bit of peak, he shipped his airplane to uh, England, where it was displayed in a British museum for 20 years. So the Smithsonian recanted and, uh, and gave him all the due that he thought was coming. So they brought their airplane back when the Smithsonian agreed to give him more recognition. Right. And are you aware of other things that they, they did looking at, out after their reputation? They were very uh, diligent in, in uh, pursuing people who they thought were making unfair claims as to uh, aviation accomplishments. And in fact, they spent many, many years in court uh, defending their patents probably more time in court, uh, correct, than working on further development of the airplane. I think that's very sad, but it's true. In, in fact, uh, they were quickly eclipsed in aviation. Okay. Any summary about the accomplishments of John Montgomery? I think uh, he was, uh, first of all, a very serious scientist and engineer who used very sound experimental and theoretical principles to arrive at a, a knowledge of aeronautics that was unique for his time, really. And he used this knowledge to design a uh, sequence of very successful flying machines. Thank you, Professor Arneman. No further questions, Your Honor. Right, uh, how do you do, Professor? I'm Richard Alexander. Is it true that when the Santa Clara flew in 1905, Professor Montgomery was not on board? That's true. And in fact, he enlisted the services of a pilot, Mr. Maloney, is that correct? That's correct. And in fact, from what we know of Professor Montgomery, uh, the one occasion for sure that we know that he flew in 1911, will you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the world what happened? Well, in the 1910-1911 time period, he made many, many successful flights in Evergreen, and on the last one of those, he was killed. Well, that certainly wouldn't be his next to last, would it? <laughs> <laughs> and Professor, I, Professor Montgomery was a member of the faculty at Santa Clara College, as it was known back then. Is that right? Yes. And the successor to Santa Clara College is Santa Clara University? Yes. 
where you were on the faculty. Yeah. And that, was, that was after you had spent 20 years working for the government at NASA, is that right? That's right. And during that 20 years, you learned all of the intricacies of, of aviation and of flight, is that right? As much as uh, most people, as much as anyone wants to say, yes. All right. And before you had worked for the United States government, learning all about flight, you had been to graduate school, is that right? Yeah. And before that, you had been to college? Yes. And before that, you were in high school? I suppose so. And before that, grade school? Yes. And before that, you sat on your mother's knee, is that right? No, before that, huh? <laughs> and Professor, isn't it true that the first time in your professional career that you ever heard of John J. Montgomery was when you were asked by Dean Neustadter to come here and testify <laughs> today. Absolutely not true. I, I pass you. <laughs> A couple of questions, John. Uh, counsel, when did you start learning about John Montgomery? I had probably heard his uh, name uh, 10, 15 years ago. Could we mark the record, please, Your Honor? Could we what? <laughs> <laughs> I would like the record marked at this time. So I may read it back to the jury later. Thank you. Uh, but when I came to Santa Clara in 1986, I uh, became seriously interested and read several books by him. I understand. Now, opposing counsel has referred to the fact that Professor Montgomery used a pilot in that flight in 1905. Yes. Any special contributions there? Uh, I would call that a positive contribution. He uh, was uh, fully aware that the pilot was almost as, as important as the airplane, and he uh, spent a great deal of time training pilots to fly his vehicles, and I think that was a real contribution. So in addition to flying himself, which he did, he was confident enough in his aircraft to train somebody else to use it. Yeah. Right, thank you. I have no further questions, John. This witness may be excused with prejudice. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Montgomery calls Shirley MacLaine. Please raise your right hand. We saw him swear the testimony about giving these proceedings. He the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I should do. Please state your name for the record. I'm Shirley MacLaine. The actress? Yes, of course. Well, it's, it's delightful to have you here after the Academy Awards, and I must say, you were just terrific in Steel Magnolias. Oh, I thank you so much, you sweet thing. <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, as a child in the 50s, I had a crush on you when you played the role of the princess in Around the World in 80 Days. Well, thank you again. Well, if you'd like to see me, you know I'm playing at the Circle Star Theater April 5th, 6th, and 7th. I'd be glad to give both you and Judge Stone free tickets if you like. The rest of my fans, you may get tickets from me right outside after this evening's hearing. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm interested, you know, in Around the World in 80 Days, did you fly actually in the balloon yourself? Oh, my heavens, no. I'm terribly afraid of flying. Oh. I had a stunt double do it for me. Oh, I see. She okay. didn't need a balloon counsel. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know anything about uh, John Montgomery? Well, I didn't know him personally. Uh, but, you know, Columbia Pictures made a wonderful movie about his life called Gallant Journey. Hmm. It starred Henry, uh, Glenn Ford, and Janet Blair. Ah, I see. Um, court's permission, I'd like to show you a poster. <laughs> Is that the poster for the movie Gallant Journey? Can I take a look at it? Yes. Why, why yes, that's it. You can see Glenn Ford. Of dashing and handsome, just like John Montgomery, bright, articulate, inventive. Uh, <laughs> yes, and he was such a family man. Janet, of course, played his wife. I suppose you know that. Regina Cleary. That's right. Yes, whom he married. Right. Now, uh, do you think you might be able to arrange a private screening of this movie for the judge? Oh, I'd love to. I have a theater right next to the swimming pool at my home. And Judge Stone, if you'd like to bring your trunks, we can just watch it right from the pool. Bring my what? Your swimming trunks. Oh. I've always, <laughs> I've always liked men with solid sounding names. I'll bring what I need. <laughs> I'll look forward to it, Your Honor. That's now, in I'm, camera hearing, counsel. <laughs> 
You said you were terribly afraid of flying? Why, yes. Now, why is that? Well, in one of my prior lives, I had some very bad experiences <laughs> with flying. What do you mean, your prior lives? Oh, well, if you've read my books, I have one here. It's on the plane, also out on a limb. I'd be glad to sell them to anyone that would like to buy them afterwards. <laughs> You'll know that I firmly believe in reincarnation. And one of the transmigrations of my soul, I was Wilbur Wright. <laughs> you were Wilbur Wright? I guess. What an unexpected surprise. <laughs> Maybe we can find out something relevant to this hearing. Uh, let me see. When did you first fly at Kitty Hawk? New Year's Eve, 1899. Well, wait a minute. I, I thought you first flew at Kitty Hawk in December 1903. No, I first met Kitty in November of 1899. <laughs> Our first date was New Year's Eve, 1899, and that's when I first flew at her. No, I'm, no, maybe you misunderstand. I'm not talking about Kitty Hawk a person. I'm talking about Kitty Hawk the airfield. Oh, there was no Kitty Hawk airfield. What about the famous flight? Why, we made it up. My crazy <laughs> brother, Orville, he had this fixation that we could become famous if we could just get that contraption of his to fly. So we went to Kill Devil Hill, it almost killed us, and tried to fly the airplane. It stood up in the air for maybe five <coughs> seconds and then it crashed. And do you know why that happened? We put the tail in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> so that's how you developed your fear of flying. That's right, even I Erica see. Young can't help me now. <laughs> Now what about that patent application you filed in 1905 and the patent suit in 1917? Oh, we made up the patent and we bought off the judge. <laughs> what was the judge's name? Judge Granite. <laughs> Thank you, no further questions. <laughs> Counsel, I don't suppose you have any cross, do you? No, Your Honor, I don't have any. I pass. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll look forward to seeing you, Your Honor. Oh, you bet. <laughs> Plaintiff rest, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Your Honor, in the interest of time, uh, may I call my first witness, please? Well, I was interested in the, uh, in the point of whether the point that uh, these are heavier than air uh, aircraft and that one of uh, Mr. Montgomery's points is that uh, in terms of the aerodynamics, it was very important that uh, the aircraft be lightweight. And speaking of that, Mr. Alexander, you may proceed. <laughs> Your Honor, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to call to the stand one of the great forerunners of modern aviation, the inventor of the helicopter, I call Signore Leonardo da Vinci. The song is where the testimony about the these proceedings will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll be done. Well, maybe. <laughs> hey, Goomba, how you doing, okay? You got your glasses there? I guess, uh, would you formally state your name for the record? Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury where you reside? What's the matter with you? I'm dead. Well, how'd you get here today? Currently, I'm on vacation from heaven. Vacation? Oh, <laughs> vacation, yeah. These guys don't stop. I painted the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. And now every time I turn around, they have me painting all of heaven, designing buildings. St. Peter says, please do this. St. who? Peter. Thank you. St. <laughs> Michael says, do that. Between me and Michelangelo, the place is really beautiful. But sometimes I just got to go away. Too many chiefs, not enough Jesuits. Well, I want to thank you very much for coming here this afternoon. It's no problem. Would you mind telling the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how you became a Renaissance man? Actually, it was easy. All you had to do was just think, like my study of flying. After all, if a bird with a bird-brained mind, bird-brained mind you, can do it, you and I should be able to do it. <laughs> 
Well, did you ever really try it yourself? Well, I thought about it and studied birds very carefully, but I never tried it. Why was that? Well, it is because of the three rules of flight that I discovered. Could I have the first chart, please? <laughs> the first rule, flying is safe. What do you mean by that? I mean, really, have you ever seen a bird lose it? <laughs> flying, is, flying is inherently safe, as long as you stay flying. You will never get hurt. That brings me to the second rule. <laughs> as you know, I have been interested in flying since the late 15th century, and I even invented the helicopter. All I needed to do was invent gasoline, and everything would have been, been a snap. But that gets me away from my story. Over the centuries, because of my interest in flying, I have been watching all the great inventors and the famous pilots, George Cayley, Orville and Wilbur Wright, Octave Chanute, Otto Lilienthal, Samuel Langley, Glenn Curtis, Amelia Earhart, and even John Montgomery. And one thing is perfectly clear. Based on this study, I have developed the second rule of flying. Landing is dangerous. I mean, you are doing everything right. The tower makes a mistake and then you're dead without even trying. That leads to the third rule of flight. May I have the third card, please? Don't fly unless you always land gently. Leonardo, based on, on your study of the history of flight over the ages, can you tell us why we have airplanes today? Yes, I would be happy to. It all started with the birds. If birds can fly, so should people, because we are smarter than birds. The problem with the birds is that pound for pound, they are stronger than people. So if you try to fly by flapping your arms, you'll never get to LAX and your 10 o'clock court appearance. I see. Now, a lot of people have made this mistake. I was one of them. The first person who really figured out how to fly was Sir George Cayley. When was that? Sir George Cayley, 1773 to 1857. What did he do? Well, he lived in England. You can tell that from the Sir George. I see. Very good. Yes. Well, he invented lift, drag, and thrust. In 1804, he invented the first monoplane with a glider with a fixed wing. He was the first to suggest biplanes and triplanes to increase lift. He's the first to fly a glider carrying a man. He invented the curved aerofoil, foil, a curved wing for providing lift. He's the first to suggest the use of internal combustion engine for power. Say, hey Leonardo, uh, having your vantage point in heaven, uh, can you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and of the world what this next exhibit is, please? Uh, yes, that shows Cayley's triplane glider that he invented in 1849. That was the year of your big gold rush, wasn't it? Yes, that's right, that's right. And, and speaking of the uh, 1800s, are you familiar with Otto Lilienthal? Of course, I know him well. He's up there. <laughs> Can you tell us what this next exhibit is, please? Ah, uh, yes, that's one of Otto's famous bird machines. He really thought wing flapping was the way to go, but he finally gave up on that and went to fixed wing gliders in 1891. This is one of his fixed bird wing specials. He was quite an attraction back in Berlin. He once glided 750 feet, but he made the mistake of violating rule three, and he died in a crash on August 9, 1896. How about this next photograph? What's this? Ah, easy question. That's Octave Chanute. See him down there on the bottom? When Lilienthal died in 1896, that's when Chanute started designing Lilienthal-type hand gliders, hang gliders. He was the person who came up with the biplane configuration. Want to know the secret? He really was a railroad engineer, and he built a lot of bridges, so he knew a lot about trusses. He died in 1927 with his shoes off. He was one of the smart ones. Never flew anything he invented. <laughs> Look at the next exhibit, and you can see how he designed his planes. Looks a lot like Wilbur and Orville Wright's plane. Actually, they became friends. What's this uh, next photograph you brought here today? That's a Sam Langley Aerodrome number 5. 
Sam was a mathematician and an astronomer. Didn't he also head up the Smithsonian Institute? Yes, he headed up the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Uh, he was also very smart. Uh, he got uh, the United States government to give him $50,000 to invent aeroplanes. He became the first American to power an aeroplane by a petrol engine in August 1903. What year was that? 1903. And he actually powered an airplane? Yes, sir. Right. But nobody was on board. Oh, I see. He crashed two planes in October and December, so the feds gave up on him. No cigar for Sam. But he had the right idea, and he made a significant contribution to flight with this idea. And, and what was that? The fourth rule. What's the fourth rule? <laughs> Get a government contract. <laughs> Why is getting a government contract so important? It's simple. Huh. Ask Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> it's simple. Crashing plane costs money. That was John J. Montgomery's biggest problems. Jesuits are pretty good raising money, but they usually buy real estate. The government, on the other hand, is really good at spending it. So if you have a choice, hook up with the government before you hook up with the Jesuits. That was Montgomery's big mistake. You see, if Montgomery had enough money, he would never have had to copy Langley's aerodrome. Copy Langley's aerodrome? Oh, sorrowfully, yes. Let me show you the next picture so you can see exactly what I mean. OK, would you explain that for us, please? Yes, this is the Santa Clara in flight on April 25, 1905. Old John Jay thought he had a hot thing because the very next day he ran out and patented it. Wait. April 26, 1905. Here's a copy of the patent. See, right there up on the top. It was April 26, 1905. 1905? Yep. Langley never complained about John kind of borrowing his idea, and Sam died in February 1906, so nothing ever came of it. So what happened next in the history of flight? Well, to tell you the truth, there were a lot of guys rooting for old John Jay, but I knew that Wilbur and Orville really were the guys to bet on. Look at this picture. Here they were in 1902 flying gliders and getting pretty good at it. So by 1903, they were ready for an engine, and that led to the flyer. This is the first real airplane. When, when did they fly this plane? December 17th, 1903. 1903? 1903. Okay, 03, <coughs> have to be sure of that. 03, thank you. It carried Oroville 120 feet. There were two more flights that day. The longest was 852 feet and lasted 59 seconds. Well, you know, looking back over the years, what was the next most interesting thing to happen in the history of aviation? Well, Louis Blériot did it on November 10th, 1907. Louis who? Blériot. What did he do? Well, let me show you this ne on this next drawing. Here's Louis's airplane, a monoplane, with a 50 horsepower engine. He flew at 1,640 feet. I guess that was a major breakthrough. Eh, not really. The really big breakthrough took place two days before Christmas, Christmas that very year. Now, wait a minute. 1907, that would have been December 23rd, 1907. What happened then? Well, uh, <clears throat> is that what happened? No, no, that's not what happened. The greatest step forward in, an, in aviation history occurred on December 23, 1907. This is it. The United States government issued the first specification for a military airplane in the history of the world. The military wanted a plane that would carry two men, travel 125 miles, and had to go 40 miles per hour. The general who wrote the specification was smart because it had to provide for a safe descent in case of an accident. He was no dummy. Any, anything else of interest to report, Leonardo? Well, you know how every motorcycle comes with a broken leg? Well, check this. Along comes Glenn Curtis, a motorcycle fanatic, and he has the ready-made engine for an aeroplane, and off he goes. I think we have a picture of Curtis and another one of his planes. Is this, is this the one here? 
yes, you're doing pretty good for a lawyer. <laughs> but then, a good, then again, you are also a pilot. What's this photo here? Well, that's a, that's a photo of uh, uh, Curtis's plane. He was the first American to fly after the Wright brothers. And on July 4th, 1908, he made a flight of 5,090 feet. So and, what was such a big deal about that? Well, no one had ever flown more than one kilometer, and he won the Scientific American Trophy for the first official public flight in the United States of more than one kilometer. Well, why did the Wright brothers get the prize from the Scientific American? Ah, they were busy working on the government contract. I see. And in fact, on September 17, 1908, Orville crashed during Army acceptance trials and killed Lieutenant Thomas Selfridge. Thomas Selfridge, that sounds familiar. Well, Selfridge. Isn't that Selfridge Air Force Base? That's correct. The propeller broke. He was the first fatality in a powered airplane. Orville was pretty badly injured, too. So Wilbur took over, and on December 31st, 1908, he flew 77 miles and won the Michelin Prize and 20,000 francs. That's when a franc was a franc for setting the world's record. Now, I was still rooting for old John Jay, I want you to know, but guys were flying circles around him, and he was still messing with gliders. In fact, on July 25th, 1909, Louis Blériot flew from France to Dover. I think we've got a picture here. There we go. Afterwards, they even threw a party for Louis in the Grand Palace in the Paris. Grand Palace, isn't that in? Where's that, please? That's in Paris. It was a standing room only party with over 100,000 people attending. Having seen aviation progress through the decades and having invented the helicopter yourself, do you have an opinion who is the father of American aviation? Yes. And, and what is that opinion, please? Well, in all honesty, there's no getting around the fact that the Wright brothers flew powered airplanes in 1903, and American aviation is powered airplanes. The more interesting question is, who is the true grandfather of American aviation? Grandfather? That's right. Who's that? The true grandfather of American aviation is Uncle Sam Langley. He was the first to get a government contract. <laughs> and in fact, he provided you Americans with the name Uncle Sam. And I know all about Uncle Sam because I was born on April 15th, 1452. <laughs> but these are the wrong questions. Wrong questions? What do you mean, Leonardo? You see, anybody can fly with an airplane. Even John J. Montgomery could fly. Chuck Yeager can fly. Even you are a pilot. There are two real fathers of flying. The first is Colonel I.M. Chizov of the USSR. Wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the, of a, we're talking about American aviation. What is this? I have the next card, please. Yeah. Lieutenant I.M. Chizov fell from an illusion aircraft in January 1942 from 22,000 feet, struck a snow-covered ravine, slid to the bottom, fracturing his pelvis and suffering severe spinal damage. He holds the world's free fall record with no parachute. <laughs> now the next oh, card. The world's first freestyle skier. <laughs> <laughs> The world's record for the best landing in the history of the world goes to Sergeant Nicholas Alkamade of the Royal Air Force. Flight Sergeant Nicholas Alkamade, RAF, jumped from a blazing Lancaster bomber over Germany on March 23, 1944, from 18,000 feet, struck a fir tree, and landed in a snowbank without breaking a bone. He holds the world's record for the best landing ever and world free fall, no broken bones, no shoot. Well, Leonardo, that, that's pretty interesting, but we're here on the campus of Santa Clara University today, and John J. Montgomery was a professor on the faculty. Can't you really say something nice about him? Wasn't he the father of something? Well, as long as you mentioned it, Professor Montgomery pretty clearly established himself as the father of modern American hang gliding. In fact, he invented it right here on the campus of Santa Clara University. The evidence is inescapable. What is the evidence? He hung from a glider, from a hot air balloon, and the balloon went up with the glider hanging from it. If that isn't hang gliding, then I'm going back to heaven. 
By the way, he also <laughs> came pretty close to inventing bungee jumping. <laughs> but nobody has figured that out yet. Arrivederci. Thank you very much, Leonardo. So good. An honor to have you here, Mr. Da Vinci. Thank you. Was she smiling? I'll never tell. You'll never tell. Mona Lisa, of course. I'll never tell. All right. And you testified that you studied birds? Absolutely. All right. And that following your study, you designed a plane with flapping wings? Yes, I did. OK. I think that's all the questions I have. <laughs> Thank you. You're excused. You go back to heaven. <laughs> counsel? I rest, Your Honor. Any rebuttal, counsel? No, Your Honor. Ready to proceed with closing argument. Closing statements, you may proceed. May it please the court, lady and gentlemen of the jury. Opposing counsel has told you a lot about the history of aviation. Taught you, taught you about German aviators and French aviators, talked about the grandfather of aviation, but he hasn't addressed the question before this court, who is the father as between the Wright brothers and Montgomery. John Montgomery flew in 1883. <coughs> His pilot made a miraculous flight from a height of over 4,000 feet in 1905 and landed safely. John Montgomery made significant contributions to aerodynamic theory, to the stability and control of the aircraft, something opposing counsel and his witness have not addressed, significant contributions to airframe structure, which they have also not addressed. John Montgomery was the first to use the name aeroplane to describe the flying machine. He was the first to reveal the principles of lateral airfoil lift distribution. Hollywood made a movie about him. <laughs> but history has left him childless too long. And what do you know about the Wright brothers? Well, you know from his brother Wilbur <laughs> that Orville was a kook and a charlatan. <laughs> You know that they put the tail at the wrong end of the aircraft. You know that they gave us propulsion. And along with it, noise and air pollution <laughs> and over-dependence on foreign sources of energy. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you know that this is that very rare case in which two rights have made a wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what do you hear on behalf of the Wright brothers? Well, you hear from Leonardo da Vinci, the man who designed the airplane with the flapping wings and who wouldn't even tell us whether the Mona Lisa was <laughs> smiling. Lee, after all these centuries, People have been in the dark so long. Shame on you for keeping us in the dark any longer. <laughs> well, they say that Orville and Wilbur Wright were the fathers of American aviation. Frankly, I find that extremely difficult to believe. Because unless I'm not up on my anatomy, it is physically impossible for two brothers to be the father of the same child. <laughs> Today you have a momentous opportunity. Spread your wings. Taxi down the runway of history. Keep your arms down, counsel, please. <laughs> Rise and glide in the currents of truth. John <coughs> Montgomery died childless in 1911. Now is the time. Was he married? No, yes, he was. But he died childless in 1911. Now is the time for a posthumous adoption. And just remember, 
The next time you bear a board an aircraft and put your life in someone else's hands, will it be recorded that your verdict was for John Montgomery <laughs> or for the brothers, two bicycle makers from Ohio <laughs> who put the tail at the front of the aircraft? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, ladies and gentlemen of the world. <laughs> to determine who is the true father of American aviation requires an understanding of just what exactly aviation is. We know that it is much more than simply gliding on currents of hot air in balsa uh, model airplanes. Just a moment, uh, uh, currents of what? <laughs> 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 it was the Wright brothers, it was the Wright brothers who proved that men and women could fly when they are powered by engines and their dedication made that dream a reality. The Wright brothers accomplishment of 1903 far eclipsed John J. Montgomery's efforts at gliders. While he was still experimenting with gliders in 1911, the world had passed him by. Three years before, Wilbur had flown 77 miles and had won the Michelin Prize. Glenn Curtis, with his motorcycle engine, had won the Scientific American Trophy in 1911. And in that same year, the French had already flown across the English Channel. Aviation today is the fruition, the completion, the end result of powered flight. Powered flight by men and women who had the vision, as Shakespeare said, to look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not. Since the beginning of American aviation, <coughs> every time a pilot has taken the active runway and has been cleared to take off, he or she has pushed the engine's throttle to the wall and in tribute to the Wright brothers have repeated those famous words of Orville Wright, who as the flyer lifted off at Kitty Hawk, turned to his brother and with excitement and with trepidation said, off we go, off we go. That's become the trumpet call of American aviation because it symbolizes the fulfillment of powered flight. And as we hear that trumpet call across the ages, and the echo of that call reminds us of all the brave men and women who have pushed the engineering of powered flight beyond the envelope, who have stretched the limits of what they could see and what they could do, and who have shrunk this planet Earth into truly a global village. It is that echo of excitement and trepidation that marks every flight, and that is the voice of American aviation.
Cohen, Alan Rocky, James McDonald, Glenn Martin, Claude Ryan, Sherman Fairchild, Jack Wortra, Leroy Grumman, O.J. Whitney, Bill Pratt, Walter Beach, Bill Piper, Clyde Cessna, Gordon Taylor, Howard Hughes, Henry Ford, Charles Rolls, Richard Byrd, Amelia Earhart, Charles Lindbergh, Lawrence Bell, Eddie Rickenbacker, Bill Moffat, Robert Goddard, Happy Boynton, the crew of the Challenger, Frank Scotty, Michael Smith, Gregory Charles, Robert McNair, Ellison Onisuka, Judah Fresnick, Sharon Krista McCall, Ken Rowe, Chuck Yeager, Dick Rutan, Gia Yeager, Bill Blair, Stanley Hiller. Alan Shepard. John Glenn. Buzz Aldrin. Mike Collins. Neil Armstrong. Glenn Curtis. And ladies and gentlemen, it all started with the two. The two who made Howard Blake a reality. Kenny Hawk, 1903. Corvo and Wilbur Wright. The great Wright brothers. The fathers of modern American aviation. I <laughs> Is it over? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, counsel, uh, thank you very much. I take it the matter is submitted to the court? That's correct, Your Honor. All right, first you'll note that we have a most distinguished jury here, uh, and the court feels impelled uh, by the law to take the matter away from the jury. <laughs> <laughs> you all know who those uh, members of the jury are. Jury in American jurisprudence is supposed to be uh, one of uh, peers of the litigants. This jury is peerless, uh, far too distinguished to decide this matter. We pride ourselves in juries knowing nothing. <laughs> Looking over the jury, they know something. And so I'll have to disqualify them and decide this case myself. Very difficult case. Uh, there are a couple of uh, minor matters to be disposed of first. With respect to the Mona Lisa, I find her to be the mother of Rose Bird. <laughs> <laughs> this business of hang, drag, and lift, I find uh, properly uh, relegated to the black and white ball in San Francisco. <laughs> it's an issue that uh, in the criminal court. <laughs> the matter of uh, taking off and landing and flying is easy and so on. I'm reminded of General Schwarzkopf's uh, warning, not warning so much as an alert to the Iraqi pilots. You take off, you die. <laughs> Alexander, I think your view is you land, you die. <laughs> Leonardo is uh, very convincing about things other than aviation. <laughs> I don't want anyone to believe that this court has any uh, bias toward or against Jesuits. I don't know what they are. I taught here for a few years, uh, and 
became a deeper mystery. I do find that the Wright brothers are the fathers of uh, public relations, self-aggrandizement. I understand Mr. Alexander's representation of them for those reasons. I do understand also uh, that this may be the wrong forum for the Wright brothers. They are, of course, the model upon which Stanford research appears to have been built. <laughs> I'll never do moot court for them again. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, I find uh, John J. Montgomery to be childless. That's been stipulated. Uh, Self-effacing, humble, wise, something this court hasn't seen in uh, a long time, and long overdue for his right place in the history of aviation. Uh, I think the matter of uh, powered flight is irrelevant to uh, the principle of principles of aviation. And I think uh, uh, notwithstanding Tom McHenry's failure in, in, in uh, uh, making San Jose and the Santa Clara Valley a place, uh, I think John J. Montgomery has indeed made it a place. Uh, and it's high time, uh, and uh, I find for John J. Montgomery. Thank you very much. This court is adjourned. <laughs>